All right, diving in today, folks, and fair warning, this one's tough. We're heading to Fall City, Washington, where a family's been shattered by an act of violence that just, well, it leaves you with more questions than answers. Definitely not your everyday story. Not at all. And the source we're looking at is an article titled Tragedy in Fall City, a family devastated by an unthinkable act. Heavy stuff, right? But it raises some really critical questions about juvenile crime, the pressures families face, and of course, the ever-present issue of access to firearms. It really puts a spotlight on those things, yeah. So here's the backdrop. October 21st, in a seemingly quiet neighborhood, this horrific event unfolds. A 15-year-old boy is accused of using his father's handgun to kill five members of his own family. His parents, two brothers just unimaginable. And that right there, that dynamic, it's not the typical mass shooting scenario we sadly hear about so often. Yeah. This is within a family unit, which adds another layer of complexity to it all. Absolutely. And you almost wouldn't believe it, but there's a glimmer of hope, I guess you could say, in the midst of this tragedy. His 11-year-old sister, she survived. Incredible. She had the presence of mind to play dead during the attack and then managed to escape, running to a neighbor's house for help. Just... What strength at that age? It really speaks volumes about her resilience and bravery. And let's not forget, her actions were key to unraveling what truly happened. Exactly. And this is where the story takes another dark turn. Because not only did this young man allegedly commit these horrific acts, but he then tried to stage the scene to make it look like his younger brother was responsible. He even put the gun near his brother's body. Oh, wow. And the article details his 911 call, where he calmly tells the operator that his brother did it and then turned the gun on himself. Chilling. That level of manipulation, especially at 15, it's a huge red flag. What's going on in his mind? Is it a complete disconnect from reality, cold-blooded calculation, or is there some other psychological factor at play here? It's baffling, honestly, and you can't help but feel for the investigators, the first responders who had to walk into that scene. Absolutely. And from a psychological perspective, understanding that attempt to shift blame is crucial. It could reveal a lot about his mental state, his understanding of the gravity of his actions. And then you have the Humiston family themselves. The article talks about how they were, by all accounts, a loving, well-respected family in Falls City. The father, Mark, was an electrical engineer. The mother, Sarah, a former nurse, they were active members of their church. So not a family on the fringes or facing any obvious external struggles. That just adds to the shock of it all. Yeah, just a normal family embedded in their community. And that makes the impact of this tragedy all the more devastating for Fall City. You know, this is a small, tight-knit community, and this event has torn through their sense of safety and security. I can't imagine the ripple effect of something like this. Grief, confusion, fear. It touches everyone in a small town. The article mentions community members coming together at a local church, seeking solace and support in the face of this unimaginable loss. It really highlights the human need to connect, to grieve collectively in times like these. It's a natural response to trauma, finding strength and shared experience, and hopefully that support will help them navigate this difficult time. So where do we go from here? The suspects in juvenile custody and he's waived his right to appear at the initial hearing. The prosecutors are aiming to handle the charges within the juvenile system, which, as you know, operates under a very different philosophy compared to the adult justice system. Right. The juvenile system is all about rehabilitation. It's about recognizing that young people are still developing, and the focus is on addressing the underlying causes of their behavior and providing the support they need to change course. But five lives have been taken. How do you balance that need for rehabilitation with the need for justice, for accountability? That's the tough question, isn't it? It's a delicate balance. The system has to acknowledge the gravity of the crime while also recognizing the potential for a young person to reform. It will be interesting to see how this case navigates that tension. And of course, we can't forget the legal process still has to unfold. The suspect's legal team has emphasized that he's presumed innocent until proven guilty, a fundamental principle of our justice system. Absolutely. Due process is paramount. Every bit of evidence needs to be thoroughly examined to ensure a fair and impartial trial. Jumping to conclusions before all the facts are in doesn't serve anyone. But even beyond the legal aspects, this case forces us to confront some larger societal issues. It raises questions about responsible gun ownership, particularly in homes with young people. How do we ensure safe storage practices? How do we recognize and address potential mental health struggles in adolescents before they reach a crisis point? 
These are critical questions and they go far beyond the specific case. It's about fostering a culture of responsibility around firearms, recognizing the warning signs of mental health issues, and making sure there are adequate resources and support systems in place for those who need them. It's a multifaceted issue for sure. It's easy to get lost in the headlines, the shock value of a case like this, but we can't forget that this is a real family, real lives lost, and a community grappling with immense pain. And for that 11-year-old girl, the survivor, this is a trauma she'll carry with her for the rest of her life. Exactly. As the story continues to unfold, we have to keep asking those tough questions. Could anything have been done to prevent this? Were there missed warning signs, opportunities for intervention that were overlooked? These are the questions that can lead to meaningful change to preventing future tragedies. So, as you process this, think about the role of family, community, and societal support. Could stronger support systems, more accessible mental health resources, or even stricter gun safety measures have made a difference? It's a complex issue, no easy answers, but it's a conversation we need to be having. Couldn't agree more. It's a conversation that needs to happen at every level, from individual families to policymakers. Exactly. And sometimes those tough conversations are the ones that lead to the most impactful solutions. Absolutely. Because even one tragedy like this is one too many. Well said.